Good evening. This is a meeting of the Northampton Department of Health and Human Services, Department Board of Health, um, November 17th, 2022. It's uh, 533. Um, and we'll start with public comment. Um, if anyone is here for public comment, please raise your electronic hand. I do not see anyone. Okay. Um, would someone like to motion, make a motion to, oh, this uh, meeting is being, uh, is on Zoom and it's being uh, recorded. Um, tonight we have uh, all our board members, uh, Cynthia Suopa, Suzanne Smith, Dallas Ducar, and Janet Grant, and myself, Joanne Levin. Um, would someone like to make a motion to open our Board of Health meeting? Move, Move to open, to open. Or, or second. <laughs> yeah. I got the second first. <laughs> okay, you got it. Um, all in favor, Dallas? Aye. I'm gonna do a roll call because we're on sort of audio here. Uh, Janet? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone. Um, we wanted to review minutes first. Why are minutes on first? Well, that's how it used to be. So I asked Kelly <laughs> because we didn't have any guest speakers tonight or presenters. I just put it back to our regular agenda order. Okay, and hopefully it won't take very long. Um, has everyone had a chance to look at the minutes? Any comments? Our English majors? <laughs> Would someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting in October. I don't have the date right in front of me. October 20th. October 20th, 2022. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. Alice, uh, any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Dallas? Aye. Janet? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. I think that's the quickest we've ever done minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, okay. New business. Um, Elliot, does everyone know Elliot? I think, uh, Elliot, do you want to introduce yourself since uh, we have two members who were not here last time? Hi there. My name is Elliot Escura, um, and I am the public health nurse for the city right now, and hopefully soon to be not the only one. <laughs> um, so I've got our latest COVID numbers, um, and I also did some some digging to get some more flu numbers as well. Um, so let me share screen. Um, oh, let me get out of my email first. <laughs> And hopefully this will load any second. Interesting. I know I have internet because I'm on here. All right. Give me one second. I'm going to try to see if I can get this to load. I don't have the, or I can pull it out of my email. Is it the dashboard, Elliot? Yeah, I uh, was gonna pull it off the website, but the website's not loading for me for a moment. So here we go. I got it. All right, so sorry about that. Here is the dashboard. Let me zoom in a little bit for y'all. Um, all 
so right now we are um, at the county level, we're in the low risk level, which um, has been true both this week and last week. Um, prior to that for quite some time, I think like a whole month, we were at the um, medium risk level. So that means that, you know, the hospitals aren't too burned in, burdened with COVID specifically right now. Um, as we know, there's several other respiratory illnesses going around. Um, and our county transmission levels uh, have been in substantial for the last two weeks as well, um, which is down from high levels. Um, so that's kind of heartening. And um, our COVID wastewater for the county has kind of plateaued, um, but actually, and I was gonna pull up the page so I could show you our, our little graph of specifically Northampton's wastewater. It actually had a little bit of a peak this week specifically. Um, so I think it's more of a watch and, and see what happens thing. You know, we often see a lot of wiggles in the data and I'm sure that Northampton specific data is gonna be messier than the whole county because it's not being kind of averaged out as much. Um, but right now, you know, it, it's still looking like COVID is not too much um, at this point of a, of a growing concern, at least. It's, we've kind of plateaued um, since the beginning of November and, and it hasn't seemed to go back up just yet. Um, that's especially good because um, we are seeing in this area, based on the CDC's information, um, a growing share of the COVID is um, the BQ.1 and the BQ.1.1 variant. Um, and I know there was a lot of concern at a certain point that that would mean uh, kind of a new wave, but that's now hit in the New England region, almost 50% of cases, and we aren't seeing a, an increase. So um, that is very good news. I did pull a report today of um, Northampton's flu numbers. And um, I, I also pulled the last couple of years. Two years ago, we had almost no flu um, because we were still in, in deeper lockdown. Um, last year, the flu cases, uh, our first flu case was essentially next week in the year. Um, and there was one for a few weeks and then it kind of started going up and um, we had sort of a double peak last year locally. Uh, one that was in December and another one that was uh, quite late, I think April. Um, this year, we already at this point have seven flu cases for this city alone. Um, and obviously that's only the people who are seeking out a flu test. Um, so we're definitely not capturing all of them. Um, we had three so far this week, three the previous week and one the week before. So it definitely started far earlier and it's and similar to what we're seeing nationally, it's looking like a pretty steep curve compared to last year. So, and I don't have any RSV numbers because we don't collect that number by city. Does the state collect those numbers? It's not a reportable illness, so I don't think they do. Um, I think particular, I know like uh, Joanne, you were able to get a Cooley number. So I think particular institutions may collect that, but I don't think it's being collected centrally. Yeah, we hadn't routinely uh, been collecting RSV in the past, but we're going to start. So I'll have a more formal report coming regularly. Um, but I did get an informal report of like the last two weeks, we've had something like 46 positive tests for RSV, which is outrageous number. Uh, we don't admit uh, pediatrics to Cooley, so we are not feeling the same thing that Bay State might be feeling with a pediatric surge. Um, but we do admit um, um, adults and adults do sometimes get RSV. So we've had two patients admitted with RSV. And I think we've had also one or two patients admitted with flu. Um, um, but our flu rates, the last numbers I saw uh, were from a couple of weeks ago. They were still, the rate was quite low out of, I gave you the numbers, one out of 166 tests or something. Those are the, the tests that are done at the hospital that I have numbers for, not the ones done in the offices on the rapid testing. Um, so the ones done through urgent care or the ER. And so it was still very low two weeks ago. And I think it's still pretty low. And um, so if you look at the map on the CDC, flu is just rampant in the South um, and it's just, it's coming. It's just, it's on its way. Um, so we'll see it shortly. Oh, yeah, Elliot, I hate to put you on the spot, but I just want to kind of put out there that we're not on, all, all of us are not in the same 
level when you speak about RSV and pneumonia and COVID. So if you can kind of just give us a general difference between um, RSV and influenza and, mm -hmm. you know, talk about that a little bit, just so we're all on the same page when we speak about this in the future, that would be super helpful to give us context. Of course. Yeah. So, so there are three different viruses. Um, you know, uh, we, we, I'm sure we all know a fair amount about COVID by this point. Um, and flu is another virus that, you know, we deal with seasonally. Um, and I think most people know a little bit about flu. RSV is something that a lot of people have not necessarily heard of. It's called, it's the, the acronym starts, stands for respiratory syncytial virus. Um, and it's a virus that is actually not that uncommon. Um, although we haven't seen it before at these levels and it tends to um, be minor in most adults and older children, but it can hit young children very hard. Particularly it's, it uh, can be deadly for um, especially infants. Um, and, you know, kind of the younger the child is, the, the more hard they can be hit. Um, and it can also be difficult for the elderly. So I'm, I'm guessing a lot of the adults who were admitted for it are, um, are elderly adults because their immune system is just, and, and they often have other health issues that cause it to hit them harder. Um, and yeah, these are all sort of, the, the flu and the RSV are things that we definitely saw seasonally for a very, very long time, um, but they seem to be hitting earlier and harder than previous years. And there's a lot of theories as to why that is. Um, I don't necessarily want to speculate. Uh, but. It was predicted though last year that we would see an influx of RSV this year, um, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, what I just, um, uh, my understanding is that with the, all the masking that we, and hand hygiene and everything we've done in the last two years, um, and now with people for the most part not masking with gatherings or in public places or restaurants and things like mm -hmm. that, people going back out, um, is that, um, well, first of all, in 2020, the fall of 2020, we had like no flu, like it was unheard of. But when everyone was masking, we had almost no flu. That was a really interesting idea. Like, oh, should we have been masking in flu seasons all along? That would have been really wise. Um, but um, that was not the way things generally worked. Um, but that is something that, you know, was brought up in the infectious disease world is like, oh, during respiratory season, should we always be masking? And, you know, to try to decrease our, our levels. But anyway, so there was almost no flu um, and a small flu season last year. And it was expected that this would be a, 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 a big flu season this year. And same for RSV. So RSV, um, usually circulates among little kids. And uh, for the last two years, we've got two years worth of new babies that have not been exposed to RSV. So we're seeing all of them at once have their first exposure to RSV. And that's when they can have a worse um, outcome and they sort of a harder time. It causes a, what's called bronchiolitis, which is sort of like a, sort of like pneumonia. Um, and, um, and it's primarily in very young kids and, um, so the you know neonatal ICUs are just filling up like crazy, and uh, it's just really impacting the the kids, um, young kids a lot, and the hospitals who take care of them. And it's just um, yeah. Go ahead, Janet. Well, just that uh, I have a friend who told me she lives in the northeast part of the state, and she has I think seven year old who she texted me yesterday and said she had RSV. RSV, not a RSVP, RSV, and also that she has pneumonia. And so I was wondering about how does that, does that make her more contagious to everybody? Um, all, all kids with RSV are considered sort of contagious. If when they're in the hospital, we put them on um, what we call droplet and contact precautions, meaning their respiratory secretions are infectious. Um, whether they're more infectious when they have pneumonia, I don't know. Certainly, possibly, we think we think that way about adults because they may be coughing a lot and sort of spewing a little bit more. I don't know if they have more virus in them or not um, when they have pneumonia, but they certainly are infectious. But are are children infectious to adults? Yes. Sure. Have the pneumonia. 
or well, people... pneumonia is a manifestation of the is the way the virus is manifested in the body it doesn't like it doesn't change how the next person behaves. So if the next person has seen RSV before, their immunity is up, they may not get pneumonia. It doesn't mean if one person has pneumonia, the next person will have pneumonia. Um, so adults can certainly get um, get sick. Generally, it's immunocompromised and elderly who have get more sick with RSV. I've also been reading that um, you know, generally for the very youngest babies who are most vulnerable, um, they often can actually get antibodies um, if their mother gets RSV uh, or parent, you know, birthing parent gets RSV, um, those antibodies will pass through the placenta and the breast milk. Um, so they're actually, there's a lot of development on a new vaccine for RSV that can be given to people when they're pregnant and those antibodies can hopefully be passed on to the babies. So that's a little bit of a hopeful news. Those antibodies only last a few months though, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're basically just protective for those very youngest, most vulnerable babies. Four months or so, something like that. Yeah. Elliot, can you also share, um, you shared with us yesterday at the SHAC meeting about the test that um, it's a test for all three? Yeah, so there is, um, I actually, I got it from the, the latest, uh, your local epidemiologist uh, sort of news. Uh, there is a test, it's usually covered by insurance, um, and basically it's an at-home test for COVID, flu, and RSV. They'll mail it to you, you get the swab, and then you mail it back to them and they'll, they'll send you the results. Um, I can send out the link for that, but it's also in the latest uh, Your Local Epidemiologist. Very cool. Um, yeah, you certainly do that in the hospital. What's that, Meredith? I was asking Elliot if we can put that up on our social, uh, social media pages or web page. Sure. Yeah. That's great. In our emergency room, we do that uh, as well. You have all three tests with rapid, rapid results. Um, so uh, I just want to add one other thing about um, sort of a COVID update with the new variants that are coming, even though it, they haven't caused a surge in hospitalization um, or a lot of new cases. Uh, with the shift from BA5 to the new variants, we've lost one of our treatments. Uh, we've lost the monoclonal antibodies. And over the course of the last two and a half years, there have been several different monoclonal antibodies which have been uh, functional and it were used to treat people who are at high risk um, of developing severe COVID. Um, our first choice is uh, Paxlovid, which should still be active, um, but um, the monoclonal antibodies we were using a second line was a one-time infusion they, we had, we were able to treat like 14 patients a week in uh, our infusion center over in the Northampton Urgent Care. Um, and it's uh, really kept people out of the hospital. Um, and with these new variants circulating, a uh, note came out from DPH yesterday, and we had started plans before that uh, to say that because so many of the variants are, are not um, affected by this monoclonal antibody, we're stopping using it. Um, uh, it's unfortunate because there could be like up to 40% of patients for whom it would work, but we don't know who they are. We don't have a test that can tell us which variant a person has. And so um, basically we're switching over to use remdesivir, which is an antiviral, which should also still work, um, but it's three infusions once a day for three days, which means our capacity will drop tremendously. We have sort of, we can do like three seatings a day, but it takes three days. We can only do um, like six a week or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's okay for right now, but if when we have a big surge, um, it might be really problematic. There might be, you know, we might not be able to have enough, enough, enough spots for people. Um, but the good news is that Paxlovid is still is still good. Unfortunately, it has a lot of drug interactions and people who are sicker who may be on sort of complicated meds, just there's some people you can't hold those meds or you can't change those meds, um, just can't take Paxlovid. So you can be in a little bit of a pickle. We'll see how things go. So Joanne, I might've missed this when you said this. Um, because you don't know what variant you're dealing with, the you can't give the monoclonal in case it is the B, yeah, yeah. The no, B 
Yeah, so so we don't have patient level information on variants, right? You get a test that's positive or negative, there's no way to know what variant it is. Right. And they look at, you know, look at the CDC page that has what's thing called Nowcast. It shows you the, the distribution of variants. You know, BA5 is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Mm -hmm. And we just sort of surpassed the border where like more than half are probably not susceptible to the monoclonal. So we are, the the uh, advice is not to give that, not to use at it at all. Okay. Elliot, can, can I ask a question about um, the transmission rate, which was um, labeled as substantial? What are the levels of transmission rate? Is substantial the highest? Um, no. So previous to the last two weeks, we were in the high transmission level. Um, and um, I'm not sure where the exact number cutoff is, um, but we're kind of at the second highest level. Okay. And substantial means from, from the infection um, world, um, you know, it's sort of like substantial. <laughs> um, with lower rates, how, how, do we, how do we look at that? Well, I... we don't really have lower rates. We just have lower than we had before. Okay. So nowhere near where we were like summer of 2021. We're just lower than our peak. Like, you know, the Omicron in January, we're like sky high. And okay. so we bounced around in April and May and sort of, you know, sort of found we have, we're at this sort of, sort of stable little, little waves thing, but it doesn't mean we're at a good level or a low level. So the community transmission, um, so substantial is, you know, colored orange. Um, and um, orange and red were thought to be like, you know, the ones you have to be careful of. Um, so we've never, re never really gone down to sort of a low, low level. Um, you know, when you, you live, when you live in the world and you know of so many people getting COVID and so many people unmasked and everything opening up, you don't know. <laughs> You don't know where truth lies, right? And so that's why I'm trying to plow yeah. through the stats and understand them. Well, it's hard, but I think the the best place to look are the um, um, biobot numbers. Oh, mm -hmm. Elliot, can you show us Northampton's numbers? Yeah, I let me see if I can get that to load now. Um, I thought I was supposed to get a copy of those, but I haven't seen them. Do you get them by email? I do yeah. now. Yeah. And Joanne, can you just explain BioBot again? To well, BioBot is a company that does COVID testing on wastewater, and they do it over the whole country, I think now. And so you can go to BioBot.com, click on data, and they'll have it, Hampshire County data. But we don't, we don't actually have testing of wastewater all over Hampshire County. I think there's one or two towns that were included in that. Right. Um, starting recently, um, they started doing it. In Northampton, is that also Biobot or is that a different company? Biobot, and you can go on our website, and I, uh, Elliot posts the weekly. Do you post the weekly data? I post. The... Yeah, I, I do a graph. I don't post the exact numbers. I can um, if you'd like. Um, I I put it into a graph that's also because weirdly enough, Biobot sends us the weekly numbers, and they send us a number of little charts. But what that doesn't include is the level over time. So I've been collecting it and making a little graph of that because mm. it seems like a useful thing to have. Um, for some reason, the um, city website is not loading for me today, um, but it is on the city website um, under where the dashboard is posted. Okay. Graph. And that's a good number for us to kind of keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, there is, we've, Northampton's numbers so far have seemed to be pretty close to the, to the, trajectory we're seeing for the county, but we did have like a little spike this week that the rest of the county didn't. So I'm kind of curious as to whether that's going to go. Okay. Anywhere. Thank you. So Meredith, I know you put me on the list for people to get the emails, but I haven't gotten them. Okay. You... I'll circle back with them to get you on okay. the yeah. yeah. All right. Um, Elliot, was there anything else you wanted to share? Does nope. anybody have any questions? Thank you. Does anybody have any questions about our data? Um, more about that 
I think, Elliot, last month you said that you were going to start going into the senior center regularly. So I was just wondering, and I, I don't know if this is an appropriate time to ask. I'm just wondering how that's going. Yeah, it's it's still fairly slow. Um, I think uh, people kind of haven't fully realized that I'm there. Um, I've been going around and introducing myself to everyone every time I go there as well. Um, but I've gotten a few people, a lot of people with questions about, um, I've gotten some questions about vaccines. I've gotten uh, one question about masking, um, a couple of general medical questions, and a lot of people wanting blood pressure checks. Um, Are you offering I'm vaccine? Not at that time, um, just because uh, we're a little wary of opening vials um, if we don't know if we're going to get many takers. Um, now, for some of our regional visits to the, some of the local senior centers, we are bringing vaccine um, in small amounts uh, in the future, just because we know they don't always have good access out in some of these farther flung areas. Um, we are having a flu clinic on Monday um, and a COVID booster clinic for children on December 1st. So spread the word. <laughs> Great. Any other, uh, we'll have departmental updates from Meredith in a little bit. Any other questions for Elliot? Okay. Um, so the um, state regs for the sale of tobacco, uh, I don't know, Meredith, if you can walk us through what we need to look at. Uh, we did have that hearing last month and we were a little confused about the difference between the state regs and our local regs and ours are in flux and how to handle that. We did ask Cheryl Sabara, uh, who's the attorney whose specialty is in tobacco regs, uh, to come to this meeting. She was not able to come this, to this meeting, but she'll attend in December. And so I thought we could sort of walk through all this information and sort of talk about it and uh, perhaps wait for Cheryl for our, you know, any final questions what people might have about how to do this um, for, and for next time. So, yeah, just to clarify, um, going back to the hearing that we had, I was able to clearly figure out where the delineation was with the suspension. And in, under 665, the, in the case of the first violation, there is a fine of $1,000. And there's only a suspension if there was a sale to a minor under that first violation. And because this was flavored products, um, there was no there's no suspension required for the first offense. So I mean, from the state's point of view. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And in our local regulation under the first offense, there is no suspension period either. So next month and just to close it out because all we did um, was we continued it so we need to actually finish that hearing and let them know um, you know that there won't be a suspension for for having the prohibited products but Cheryl will be there and can clarify even more um Kelly had provided you in advance a copy of our local regulation and she also provided you the um, state uh, sample regulation restricting the sale of tobacco and vape products. This was um, the newest iteration that they have and um, if you all had a chance to review it, what they did was they color coded um, anything that is in yellow is the state law, um, the one that was in effect of June, 2020. And then everything else are kind of recommendations. These again are model regulations that, you know, um, MAHB, MTCP would like to see in the local regulations, much of what we already had. Um, there were a lot of recommendations under, defini under definitions just to kind of shore them up, make them clearer. Um, and or add to them. And I don't know how you want to do this if you kind of just want to go through it at this point. And then next meeting, we can um, have input from Cheryl. And then the following meeting, we can um, actually have a hearing on amending our regulations or not. But um, anyways, at a minimum, if we don't want to change anything in, the reg in our regulations, what we do need to do is to make a decision on the fining structure. Do we want to make our whole regulation subject to the state fining structure, or do we want to have two different fining structures? One 
for the state under 665, there are certain infractions that fall under it where you need to have those penalties of 1,000, 3,000, and 5,000 with the suspension periods. And then our local um, regulations that don't fall under 665 have our finding structure. So we either have two finding structures or we can adopt um, the state finding structure for the entire regulation. So I think that's something important that we should think about. And the other thing that I think we need to think about is under the state finding structure, under sales to minor, there is a suspension period and it's anywhere between for first offense, one day and 30 days. I'd like to see us have a finite amount of days for that first violation for a sale to a minor just so it's equitable across the board and we're not left with having to make a decision on how many days at every hearing. So if this is your first offense, sale to a minor, um, Cheryl recommends, I recommend, you know, maybe three days be that suspension period because then the second offense is seven days and the third, event, uh, third offense is 30 days. So those are two things that I think we should definitely move forward with. I also do think there are things in this model regulation that we should consider adapting into um, our regulation. So, so if we were to do, this is so confusing, if we were to do two finding structures, we would have to know which offense falls into the state regs and which offense falls into our local regs, which yep. is not marked that way, you know, except for the color coding on this sample, it's not really marked that way. It, that would be really is, confusing. Uh, it's not because if you go to page 16 and 17, um, it lists what policies are under the state. So it's it, it's a it's pretty clear. So anything on the left-hand side, starting on page 16, going down to 17, mm -hmm. are subject to the state fine. Meredith? Yep. Um, could you give your opinion on the um, benefits and the problems of having two different finding structures? I mean, other than the obvious confusion, <laughs> um, but is there a benefit to moving just to the state finding structure, although it's very steep for all of the um, violations that are under our regs? Or, does it make sense that other um, violations are not as egregious as selling to minors? Yeah, um, so the sale of flavored products is egregious as the sale to a minor, I feel, but that's under the state law. The only, there are a few under our local reg that don't fall under the state that are certainly problematic and we see time and time again, and that's, um, you know, selling cigars under minimum pricing and the sale of blunt wraps or rolling papers. Um, do the rest of them are, we, it's usually more, if we find that violation when we're doing an inspection, it's more about just compliance at that time, a little education and letting them know. I mean, the most common violation outside of those 665 ones are not having the proper signs. And we give them the signs every time we go out and they don't have them because a new store manager came and changed things, took off, you know, took things off the wall. I don't think for a lack of signage, there should be a thousand dollar penalty and or perhaps a loss of your permit. So, but I, you know, with that being said, we have the discretion as the inspectors. So it doesn't mean if we adopt this one finding structure and we go out and they don't have their signs, we don't have to issue a violation notice. We could just, again, take this opportunity to do education and give them the proper signs. Um, I'm looking at the list right now. Signage was, is not on either list, I think. Yeah, it's under our local regulation. Well, actually it's a state regulation now, isn't it? But I don't know if it's a 665. When you say 665, you mean part of this new yeah. eight reg? Is that yep. what you're? Yep, 105 CMR 665. Um, I don't see signages anywhere here. 
not in this list. It's on the list on 17. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, required retailer signage. Mm -hmm. So so under that state reg, failure to have signage would cause that big? I'm guessing, yeah. OK. Um, so yeah, no, I, cigars regulated. We just, just be blunt wraps and cigar and cigars. Just seems so cumbersome to me to try to have two different systems and you know which ones which doesn't doesn't really make sense. No, uh, it's completely confusing. I agree a hundred percent. As I long as, as long as you use education for the sort of the first offense and for as often, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is sense. it permissible to put in our regs, even though these are new state regs? Is it per permissible for us to put the about the discretion that um, an inspector would have? Um, no, because the state. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, we can use discretion without actually writing a violation order. So once we write it in an order, yeah, then right. Yeah, that's that's more lenient than the state regs. So that's not mm -hmm. going to fly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As long as the inspectors know, but I do think that a lot of education is going to be required for this. These are really stiff fines mm -hmm. for small stores. Yep. Yeah. I was wondering about that in terms of the suspension because the person who came last month, who the owner of the store. I mean, this is this is just my, my observation that the one thousand dollars he was very willing to just kind of hear, mm -hmm. but it was the suspension he didn't want, and so I was curious about how much money a store loses with each day of suspension, and I'm sure it's different for each store, but it just do you have a, a sense of that at all? No, I don't know how much the stores make off of tobacco and nicotine, but yeah, that's always the point of contention. I feel like every hearing that we have, they're willing to pay the fine, but they're yeah. asking for forgiveness of the suspension, period. Yeah. And it I was, think it's significant. I, really I, I recall from our previous review of our regulations and when we had public uh, comment that Folks were saying that 40 to 60% of their income for these small stores is due to tobacco sales. Right. And if they can't buy tobacco there, then they're not selling the incidentals too that someone might come in for. So it's a, it's yeah. pretty significant. I just want to add something here right now because I just went back and looked to double check before I spoke. We've never fined someone for anything outside of sales or flavor. Yep. So we have it, we know we've seen that on, you know, during inspections, but again, it's more about compliance and getting people to where they need to be at. Alice? Yeah, that, that quote around uh, tobacco sales that you said, Suzanne, does that include other nicotine delivery systems as well, besides? I, I don't really. Oh, we're losing you. We lost you, Suzanne. For some reason, it's odd. But that forty percent number rings true to me too. And um, but that's not that's cigarettes and also electronic. We, cigarettes. we just you know the the owners will say I'm losing this significant part of my business and they sure. don't uh, parse it to that to that level of detail. Yeah. You can also um, imagine that if they don't have tobacco products on their shelves, then people have to go elsewhere. Maybe they'll form new habits and go somewhere else. Yeah. After that and not come back. So it's a big, big deal, I think. Yeah. Yep. Can't, I can't hear you. Do you want to mute and unmute again or something? Not it's sure. not muted. Here we go. I worked. No. Well, no. now you're muted. Oh, you now. That You're good. good. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I'm back. Uh, th thank you for remembering that 60% as well, Cynthia. I, I, I do. 
I was struck by that number as yeah. the proportion of sales. Um, so it's in that ballpark. And, and we didn't, as I recall, we didn't break it down by specific tobacco products. Well, with the, at that hearing, the, we were trying to, we were considering taking all tobacco products out of convenience stores and th that's the, what they quoted us, you know, that it was more. Yeah. Than yep. So. Another thing that I think we should consider is our cap. I mean, I would love to, if you guys want just to discuss, have an overall discussion of the model regulations and what we have and what we don't have. I mean, we can't deliberate on anything, but at least you guys know the difference. I mean, that might be a good starting point. And then we can have questions prepared for um, Cheryl in December. On this front page is a checklist. So do you want to just take a topic by topic on the checklist? Because I think some of these we already have in place, and there's just a few that we probably don't have in place. Uh, yeah, let me share my screen. Okay, here's the checklist. Oh, you uh, color coded it. Excellent. <laughs> so, number one, we have number two, permit renewal after three sales. We revoke it actually on the fourth sale, so that's already there. We have a cap, it's 29. Uh, Kelly, is it 29, as she told me? Yes. Okay, our current cap is 29. I think we only have 25 retailers. It might be a great opportunity to reduce this cap since we don't have um, as many as we did when we passed the last. Mm -hmm. um, number four and five, we don't have this included in our regulation. New permits 500 feet from a school. Um, we do ban smoking bars, not in our sales regulation, but in our smoke-free workplace regulation. Um, we include minimum cigar packaging. However, um, cigar packaging, what did she say about that? They recommend increasing it. Right now, our regulation is $250 for one, $5 for two. Um, they are recommending, oh, I have it in here. Sorry, I actually put notes in here. Ah, uh, nope, I put what ours, okay. So they recommend um, $2.90 for one and five eighty dollars for two. So to increase it to that. Uh, go back up. Restrict flavor tobacco products. We do, including mint, menthol, and wintergreen. We've done that. Ban blunt wraps. Yes. Um, ban free distribution of tobacco. Yes. Ban coupons. Yes. Self displays. We do. Um, ban tobacco products in educational institutions. We do. Um, and here is just all the penalties and suspension language down there, 14 through 17. So we have really good solid regulations. I think my biggest takeaway when I was looking at them is we could really shore up some of our definitions because I, I mean, I'm on the MTCP meeting monthly and people discuss about, um, some of, some of the things that happen in court at Board of Health meetings because of, because of wordsmithing things, you know, how their, defin their definition reads versus the model regulation. And as Cheryl being the attorney and representing, representing the communities, it's really kind of, it makes it challenging for her. She knows that these definitions that they recommend hold up in any court system. So they're really over time, I think what happens is, you know, big tobacco finds loopholes and definitions and ways around it and wins, you know, in court cases. So um, there's, we could do some cleaning up on our definitions. All along though, I think we've, for the most part, used the verbiage that Cheryl gave us. Yes, most definitely. Yeah, yeah. like 
Flint wrap, there's just this one little section that I circled that we could add. Our characterizing flavor was great. We're definitely, yeah, much further along than many other communities. Um, this is a new def uh, definition, this part right here in cigars. We have these liquid nic nicotine container. There's just one sentence that we don't have about childproof packaging. Rolling papers is one that I'd like to include. Um, regulating rolling papers, we weren't allowed to do before. Um, it used to be preempted. So um, the law wouldn't allow to do that, but now we can. So we see rolling papers everywhere, especially flavored rolling papers. So to include that would be a benefit. Um, we don't allow smoking bars. So that's a moot point. We had 21. And this is all including smoking bars, but we don't need to. Don't you love my writing? <laughs> God. Um, identification in tobacconists, we've already had that. So yeah, we're we're in really, really good shape. The per yeah, we didn't we could include indoor in our um, definition here for permit. All required Massachusetts DOR licenses need to be hung conspicuously. I'd like to add that, that's a local. We require it that they put their DOR number on their application, but it'd be easier for the inspectors if it was hanging. Uh, number six. As an effective date of this regulation, no new adult-only tobacco retail stores shall be located within 25 feet of, a, of an existing retailer with a tobacco product sales permit. She's recommending we use 500 feet. From another tobacco retailer? No, that's schools, Joanne. And then and the next one is of an existing permittee. 500 feet. From the front page, number five. Number four is 500 feet of a school. Number five is no new permits within 500 feet of an existing permittee. On the, on the checklist page? Yeah, I think that's a typo, no? Because it contradicts. Number six here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, don't I don't understand it anyways. The impact of that. That's it, something reduce, it may reduce, well, if you had an open permit, it would just reduce, if you had several open permits, it would reduce the number of new lo locations because it would be hard to find a location. It might be hard to find a location. Hmm. Let's ask Cheryl about that, if, what, what they really meant by that. Yeah. 25 feet is like the next storefront. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have a lot of meaning if it if that's the actual language you know what i'm thinking it was um you remember how like birds store um they wanted to take half of their store to be a convenience store and the other half to be a tobacconist or an adult only retail store mm -hmm. i think it was trying to prevent stores from doing that mm -hmm. so there needed to be you know a separate entrance or what have you maybe that was the intent behind number six i'm not sure But that's a good question for Cheryl. Um, number nine, a tobacco sales permit won't be renewed. If you have um, three sales, we have that already. We revoke and four. Tobacco sales permit, okay, we have 29. No, we currently have 24. 29 is in our regulation, so that might be an opportunity to reduce. Um, this is the retail store, tobacco retail store, 500 feet from a public or private elementary school. And this is for new retailers, not existing. And then here it is, a tobacco retail permit shall not be issued to a new applicant for a retail location within 500 feet of a retailer with a valid tobacco product sales permit. So it sounds like Cynthia is correct that that other one's a typo. Uh-huh. 
that makes more sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Smoking bars, yep, we do that. The cigars, because of the consumer index has increased, they recommend we increase that. Here is flavored tobacco product. She's just, we have this. Um, just recommending we add a few little words in there to shore that up a little bit. Nicotine content. Oh, this is a new state law. This is one that we'd want to add. I mean, we don't have to add it because there is the state law, but they're recommending that we adopt that into our regulation. So anything greater than 35 milligrams um, has to be sold in an adult only store, not in just a regular convenience store. Blunt wraps we have, self-service we have, roll your owns we have, educational institutions we have, and then it brings us down to the fines. The only other food for thought here is in our local regulation, we did away with the tolling period years and years ago. So we used to have a tolling period of, I believe, 24 months. So if you had um, three infractions within 24 months, then you, your fourth, your permit would be revoked. But with the tolling period, if you had three, uh, excuse me, two within the first 24 months, and then the third one was on the 25th month, it, the clock starts over. And that was really confusing too. So we ended up just getting rid of the tolling period altogether. And Cheryl said that we could do the same thing here too. If we didn't want this 36 month tolling period, we didn't have to have it. And that's it. Are you saying tolling period? I'm not. Tolling, T-O-L-L-I-N-G. If you look where my, let's see, tolling, where do they use that in here? I think, I think up a bit. I think on the page before. Oh, okay, gotcha. Well, anyways, I, they used to use that that language. Um, it's just a term, a finite term. So if you have a certain letter, amount of violations. Letter B, 1B says within 36 months. That's the tolling period, right? And letter C, yep. three more violations within 36 months. Yep. So the tolling period means a period of time that anybody, you know, it can vary based on the city or something like that. But within that time, how many violations would occur? Correct. And after that, the clock starts all over again. So if every three years they have three violations, every three years they're allowed three violations before, you know, and not get kicked out. We, I think last time we did this, we just said, we, this is a lifetime thing, right? We decided not to have a tolling period. Right. So, so the tolling period pauses the clock. So it restarts the clock. So on the 30, if you've had um, three violations within 36 months and your fourth was in th on the 37th month, that's actually your first violation again. Okay. So we don't have that in our current regs. Our current regs do not have a tolling period. No. But we are allowed to not have the tolling period, so that would differ from right. the state regs, right? It because it's more strict than the than the state regulation, we can do that. We couldn't say, uh, in the case of three or more violations within forty month within a forty month period, because that's less strict than the state. Meredith, in trying to simplify this a bit, um, 
we have to have the state well, do we have to use their definitions as well or is that just recommended it's recommended and um you know because some of the old definitions that were provided up to us through mahb don't hold up in court anymore okay. cheryl is recommending that we adopt the new definitions they're clear they're concise they've been tested okay so if we if we agree to accept all of the new definition or the amendments to any definitions and inclusion of any ones we don't already have. Mm -hmm. And the components that we must have mm -hmm. based on the state regs, mm -hmm. we're actually talking about very few points. Yep. Right. Um, I'm trying to simplify this because, yep. because my eyes can blur over. But um, it, to my way of thinking, we accept the definitions, we accept the new regs, mm -hmm. and there are a few of the green components that we might want to discuss. But the real section that requires the most in-depth conversation is whether we want to have stricter fines. Correct. So that makes it easier for me to understand. Right. And the few greens that I've identified are the cigar prices, reducing the RCAP, what we have, and I do believe that's it, just the finding structure. So if you go back uh, later, if you wanna look at that very first page as a checklist, it's number three is the cap, number five is 500 feet from an existing permittee. Number seven is the cigar pricing. And then 14 and later, 14 through 18. I think that covers all of them because all the other ones we have and they're all set. So 357 and then 14 through 18. That's right. Reducing the caps, the other, the other major one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a great opportunity to do that. And the last one on the checklist is shall versus may language. And last time we did this, we decide to have shall or will as opposed to may so that we didn't have to, we wouldn't be playing favorites or having any sort of decision making around it. It was just straight ahead. Um, so I don't yeah. know if you want to discuss that or just leave it. Um, could you, I, sorry, could you just clarify what? what the difference so, is? so for example um for a penalty so someone someone's accused of of a violation and we say that the violation occurred and then when they say what should the penalty be it, it we may have them find or we may have them take the um tobacco products off their shelf or does it say that we will so once gotcha. Yeah, so it it leaves there's less wiggle room and less yeah. less for us to the hand ring about, gotcha. um, and I think it makes us more even handed and and fair actually. Understood. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the state right now, and they use the word shall, so I guess that would only be in play if we kept our um local finding structure in uh, our local mm -hmm. finding structure which we already have shall so it doesn't make a difference mm -hmm. we're already there it it sounds like it sounds like there's some consensus around trying to make things as equitable as possible but there's some discernment that might still happen in terms of the punishment or, or the there's uh if someone violates a rule in some way um is that right like if if there's not a sign up for example that, that that's really where there's less equity it's up to the individual's discernment up to the inspector? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, there is some latitude there. I mean, the regulation says that, you know, 
we can issue a violation order, um, but our philosophy in the DHHS is to educate and mm -hmm. clients. So um, I can't think of a single case where we issued a violation order for anything outside of a sale to a minor or um, sale of prohibited tobacco or nicotine products. Okay. So in our latest hearing, there was a signage signage issue, but it was not the only issue. Okay. Signage was cited, but it that was not the only infraction. Right? And we could have stacked all of those as individual violations and clearly gone over the you know number three violations. But again, we don't tend, and we haven't in the past, nor do I foresee us doing in the future, issuing fines or violations for something such as signage. And, and that is up to uh, DHHS as yes. a cultural stance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, and Meredith, I, I understand that and I agree with you, but what if, what if we have a constant um, non-compliant um, um, vendor who has been educated but continues to be non-compliant? So then um, we could move forward and issue a violation letter. And we do have repeat offenders, you know, yeah. for like signs. Um, but again, I don't, we're there so often at all of these convenience stores. And, you know, it's something my inspectors are very in tune with. They don't have them, we just reissue. Um, I just don't feel like that would ever come to a point in my mind where they should be issued a, you know, a financial penalty for that. Um, and, and again, I keep on using the signage as the um, example here because that's the one that we see over and over again. And historically in certain establishments, it's because people just, they're pieces of paper that people move around or cover yeah. up with something. Um, it gets lost a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and Meredith, do you see that the education is effective, that there are? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it sounds like you're accomplishing your goal. Yes. <laughs> are, yeah. When you're talking about signage, are you also talking about um, the sign that says something about, you know, you must be at least 21 to purchase tobacco products. So you don't see that as um, problematic if they don't have it on a regular well, basis? I mean, the We Card All is a local regulation that, um, that we are the only one that I know of in Massachusetts that actually has that regulation. And we provide them the signs and those usually are not one of the signs that aren't there because that has to be right at the point of sale. So right. it's down or underneath a piece of plexiglass. So that one's usually not lost. It's more about um, tobacco cessation or um, something about, um, I don't know what the signs are offhand, but one that has to be posted, you know, four feet high in a conspicuous place. And then they put some type of calendar over it. I mean, it's just Sometimes they're there and something's covering them up, but that we card all sign, I mean, right at the point of sale, that's hardly ever missing. It's more of like the permit sign or mm -hmm. something that really isn't going to have an impact on, on sales. Mm -hmm. And I think actually um, within the last quarter, our inspectors brought everyone a whole new set of new signs because the state added more signs to the requirements and had the merchants sign off that they received them. Because a lot of times we hear, oh, you know, we didn't get it. So, I mean, we're always out there educating, trying to have this checks and balance system. So when would we um, talk about it sounds like this is a whole separate discussion about placing a cap on the number of licenses so you guys can have the discussion we'll have cheryl in next month and you can have a discussion if you'd like to move forward with that and what we'll do is 
Cheryl and I will draft um, a regulation with everything that you want included. And then we'll have a hearing in January or February. Um, and you'll vote on what parts you would like to um, amend. And if one of them is the cap, you'll vote on it then. Is there, is it part of, or can Cheryl talk next month about things to consider in terms of a cap? Like reduce with attrition, other things than just reducing at this point, like other strategies. Well, well, what are, no, what are, no, what are the, what are the benefits of reducing? What, what could we maybe see? I mean, how would we make that determination in terms of a number and stuff like that if we were to, to decide to do that? So when we instituted the cap, we actually set the cap at the number of merchants that we had at that time. But um, we talk about, you know, the more businesses out there with more um, marketing, tobacco and nicotine marketing, the more normalized it becomes for the community. So if we reduce that, then, um, you know, perhaps children see less of those marketing tools and employees that big tobacco use. So it's about normalization. It's about population density. They used to use taffy sheets long time ago. And probably Cynthia, you probably know more about that than I do. Um, that per your population, there was like a formula that would kind of inform you on how many or what should be a, um, a maximum amount of retailers, tobacco retailers. I don't think those are used so much as of late. But um, yeah, I'm sure Cheryl can provide us with some more information. I recall, um, we have this this discussion about caps every time we re revise the regs. And I recall at one time we limited, we set the cap at the existing permits plus one. Plus one, right. Mm -hmm. Just in case somebody came into the, um, to the city and um, wanted to open a convenience store and they could have that opportunity. But I'm impressed with the fact that there are four open permits. That indicates to me that this attrition is working. And I just, it's just my personal opinion. I would vote to cap it on the existing permits because we have this data. We, we have open permits. So let's cap it at the current number and I don't see any reason to add any more than that. Alice? Just so I understand, uh, the tobacco caps also, they're, they're caps on the sale of e-cigs or is that separate? Is this is just tobacco leaf products? It's tobacco and nicotine. But not nicotine gum, but e-cigarettes? Yes, all your e-cigarettes, your vapes, right? Not nicotine gum, that's a cessation product, okay. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, I guess I just am curious if, if the goal is to reduce, I, I guess I'm wondering what the goal is. Like if the goal is to reduce the amount of people that are using nicotine based products that are not cessation products, then, um, wouldn't it be in line with our, our goals to reduce this as much as possible without necessarily, I guess, angering the public in a way that, right? I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I guess in an ideal situation, we would be going even lower on the caps. I guess, I guess what I'm wondering is what, what's, the, what is the benchmark here? Like why, why is it just to not remove existing licenses so we don't anger folks? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I don't mind I'm taking a stab. Start out loud. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind taking a stab at it because I I personally feel any opportunity we have to lower, we should look at that opportunity really seriously in terms of the overall goal, as you mentioned, Alice, to reduce some um, <clears throat> nicotine use in the community. So um, I'm. Yeah, it's it's interesting that tonight the city council is talking about capping the number of marijuana establishments because that wasn't done before. <laughs> and so um, 
Um, so I, you know, what our goal would be according to that. But I, you know, I think, um, I think this, we need to continue to keep our eyes on, on the goal of reducing the use of um, these products. And this is one measure a way to do it. Um, and um, Suzanne, I wasn't sure when you said, should, were you recommending to go down from 29 to 25? Cause we have four open, is that what yes. you were? Yes, I was. I, oh, was, okay. I was advocating to eliminate those licenses that are not currently being used. I think yeah. um, Dallas, the, the public is already used to just 25 outlets. Sure, yep. So that's, that's, that's our existing point. I thought so, she said 24. I thought Meredith said it was 24. Is, did I get 24. that wrong? 20, 24. 24, well, 24, then we're down five. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. From the twenty nine. Yeah, that's what twenty five earlier. Even better. <laughs> Whatever the current number of licenses is, let us cap it at that number. And I no longer feel the need to leave any of those licenses open, based on what we have learned from our previous caps. That they're not the caps. We're not reaching the caps. So let's cut the cap. To what our to our current status mm -hmm. 24 there you go hopefully that means that people going into business don't find that a a encouraging business model or or you know, yeah it's not so but and, you know in keeping with that philosophy i'm i'm wondering if we could have the the philosophy of as um we don't we don't know as a board when the licenses are open but uh, we could just have a conversation about any time a license is open, we would reduce the cap. We couldn't have that written in at, like that. That was that is an option of writing it into the regs that way. Yeah, that, yeah. That's reducing through attrition, but they do say that if a new store comes in with the same store model, business model, then that you don't get rid of that tobacco license, even though it's a new store owner. Right. And who's the they, Meredith? Uh, Cheryl Sabara. Okay. Okay. I mean, uh, within the year or within a certain yeah, time within frame? a certain time frame, six months or a year. I'm not sure what it is, but right. yeah, it, it, it's in this document somewhere. Uh, I, we've had this discussion in the past that um, if we eliminate a license when a business is sold, that completely devalues the value of that that business. And so we are essentially telling anyone who wants to sell a business and retire that uh, what you're trying to sell has no value anymore. But I think the regs do say that if a business is sold, the license can sort of go with it. So they don't have to return it to. I think they do. It's non-transferable. Yeah. But, 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 then, but then you allow the next people in that location to have it. Yeah. To apply, right. But if it goes from a Cumberland Farms to a Starbucks and then back to a Cumberland Farms, the license is gone and we would have reduced it through attrition because the business model is different in between. Do, do we have any indication of how many tobacco products are being sold per license? Like if if there's one person with a license that's selling a lot more. And so it maybe seems like there's less being sold, but actually someone's just getting really good at selling these products at one store specifically. We, we, that would be an impossible task because the products come out faster than we even know and keep, can keep our eyes on. And they come out with alias names and, you know, um, a vape that's called clear actually smells like fruit punch and we don't know it until we buy it and open it and smell it for ourselves. Like it is so hard. Cheryl's famous saying is we're always playing whack-a-mole with big tobacco and we are still doing that to, you know, today. And it's been like 30 years we've been playing this game. Um, so there are so many products out there, even products like Delta 8, Delta 9, Delta 10, which are all synthetic um, THC that, you know, falls under this 
non-regulation line too that we're trying to catch up with. Yeah. If you like go in, Alice, and just look, there's like a thousand different products in some of these stores. Yeah, no, no. I yeah, I, I guess what I'm just suggesting is that we might be thinking this is a, a success of attrition, but it could also be a business getting better, one individual business with one license getting better at selling uh things, right? Or like consolidation. Or consolidation, yeah, exactly, under one license. The, yeah, the, hard to know. Less, less licenses don't necessarily mean that there's less people, you know, using tobacco products, right? Right. But you know, having less stores have it, I think to Meredith's point earlier about uh, the normalization of tobacco use and young people, because that's really who we're trying to not use tobacco products is young people, because they're the ones that tobacco industry is just, um, you know, trying to have them become lifelong smokers by starting early. The established smokers are going to find and, you know, with the good marketing tactics, yes, they might be going to certain stores, but if we have less stores, selling, then that's just less exposure to the signage and to kind of the normalization when a young person goes into the store, you know, their local store, the convenience store or gas station or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think, I think, you know, there, there's a lot of evidence that um, just having less retail outlets reduces um, the amount of young people who take it up. Yeah, that makes sense. I agree. I just, yeah. Do I was wondering what what is the, what is the um, cost of a license? I'm just curious. Kelly can answer that for you. Two fifty a year. Yes. Are we obligated to have a? Uh, public session on this before we vote? Yes. Just wanted to make sure that that's still true, even though we're mostly adhering to state regs, but some, some things will probably be stricter and different. Yeah. So that makes the regs different than the state regs. And if we decide to adopt, adopt the state fines, that might be controversial because they're significantly heavier than we've had before. I thought we had to adopt their fines. For the no, have one finding structure for the entire regulation, which is a combination of state and our local, I think is what Joanne is referring to. Okay. So may I, based off the conversation that we had tonight, get in touch with Cheryl and come up with a draft and then present it to you before December's meeting so we have something to work off of? Would that be okay? And maybe a, a list of the things that are changed in the draft other than minor things like these discussion items that we can take up point by point with uh, with Cheryl. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. That would be helpful. Okay. Any other questions or comments about this? Great. Thank you, Marina. Um, just one other thing that I thought we might do maybe after we're done with these regs. So we'll see Cheryl in December and maybe have the public hearing in January uh, at some time after that, that I thought maybe we could dedicate some time at a meeting when we don't have a lot else on the agenda to talk about what we as a board want to do. Um, sort of like a retreat, but of course it has to be an open public meeting. Um, and uh, Cynthia's agreed to sort of help me sort of organize how we might have that kind of discussion. Um, is that of interest? Yes. Can I, can I introduce something on this topic, Joanne? Sure. Just to, um, very briefly and to get Meredith's expertise on it. Um, I'm working on another project in the city and um, it, um, sorry. Um, came to my attention that um, there was a city council resolution 20.107 that was done in 2020 that talks about um, combat, combating the public health crisis of systemic racism. 
And um, there's a great deal, I, and Meredith, you've referred to this about social determinants of health. Um, there's a lot of emphasis being put on that at the Department of Public, Public Health. And um, one of the recommendations in this city council resolution that was passed under the Narcowitz um, term was to declare racism as a public health issue. And secondly, to um, appoint, I'll, I'll say someone similar to a DEI, a diversity, equity, and inclusion person in the city to do this kind of work. Amherst has one, some of the other communities do. Um, none, those two recommendations have not been followed through from, from this particular resolution. So, so yeah. yeah. I believe we have passed the racism as a public health issue. Oh, right, but the question is um, in a white space. <laughs> so I, I understand, but that's yeah. the first component. Um, right. What to do is, of course, yes. the heavy lifting. Yes, yes. And so that's, um, I, I mean, I think that that's something that we can certainly talk about. But Meredith, you made a reference, I think, at our last meeting saying, oh, and then we have social determinants of health that are starting to, there's funding behind it. It, it. It's a huge emphasis at DPH. And I just wondered if you could just, um, you know, from your work on the, um, with the Department of Community Care, if that's something that's coming across your desk. Of course, yeah, we always wanna think about that and weave it into our work and what does it mean? Um, but the first thing that we're really talking about is educating our community partners because people don't even really understand what the social determinants of health are. Yeah. So, right. So we're actually looking to hire someone to, not just for the DCC, but for the DHHS to be, we don't, we're not going to call them a DEI, but um, to talk about health equity, to talk about social justice, racism, um, social determinants of health and train, and we're gonna start from, start from the top down. We're, we wanna train um, our municipal employees. We wanna train all of our, um, you know, our, com our committees, our boards that we have in the community. We want everyone to start thinking about these, um, especially the people who make policy decisions, super, super important. So we are just thinking about that here in the DHHS and how we can expand that out into the municipality and into the community. Um, so we're really taking a closer look at that and we're taking a little bit from all of our grants to create this one position to help move that message forward. That's great, that's great news. And, and I don't know how jo Joanna, you know, we talk about how does a board of health who does policy mm -hmm. fit into this framework. And that's always been like, I'm scratching my head. And so hopefully we can have a conversation about that or have somebody guide us in, in a particular- I know, I'm wondering if, if you guys have a conversation about you know goals or policy work that you wanna work towards, having a, consult, a consultant to come in and help write a strategic plan um, could be super helpful. Just something to think about. That consultant, meaning the person you're looking to hire or somebody no, else? Oh. Outside consultant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know our budget's very low, but. I was going to say, are you paying for it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're talking about a strategic plan for the board specifically? For the board, for the board specifically. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like this is, you know, Janet and Dallas, I mean, we've definitely had this conversation that we want to do more, but we get stuck a little bit, you know, um, not for any other reason, you know, COVID happened or, you know, the tobacco regulations need to be amended again. We kind of have these cyclic things beyond COVID that have come up. Um, but I think it's super important that you as board members are passionate about the work that you do. And um, so you know, having that, I mean, that's what's going to give us retention, um, that and Pinky promises to a few of you that you promise to stay on the board until I resign in 10 years. Uh, <laughs> Only 10? I'm not kidding. <laughs> I remember it as nine. <laughs> um, but yeah. So my concern has been that we don't have a budget. We don't really have, you know, specifically dedicated staff. And our only tool is regulation, telling people what they can't do. 
So I feel like, you know, and, and maybe letter writing. I mean, I, I don't know. That's That's been my frustration. If we have all kinds of health issues, that'll be fun to work on. But what tools do we have? So that's something we, we can talk about. Very powerful tools. You are you are the policy setting board. You have policy and you have health education and promotion. Like just look at the um, ventilation task force that you've been working so hard on. Like, isn't this something that came about at our last meeting? Like, let's think about something more broad scoped and have a policy about new construction meeting these certain requirements, you know, air circulation and air quality requirements. That is a power that, you know, goes a long way and has huge impact. So. And, but Ken, I mean, I know there's like building code people and, you know, there's all completely different departments within the city that deal with new construction and stuff. Is that something that the board still could have a say over things like so, that? So, right. I mean, we'd want to do this collaboratively and if obviously we wouldn't want it to clash with any existing building codes or any other codes out there. Um, we'd want to enhance it. Yeah, I, I mean, I also feel like that's why strategic planning could be so helpful too, right? Like we're not to say by any means that the COVID pandemic is over, but there have been, you know, we're, we're in a space now where we're not at a peak at the very least. And we also have DHHS now, like there's a restructuring that's happened too. And it, 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 and there's a full board. I mean, it just feels like this would be a more opportune time for some slower thinking and, and thinking about what we can do, right? Like instead of being as reactive perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. right. There are things we're not thinking about right now that we could think about with more time. Right. Yeah, so there are a million things that are related to health. I mean, just about everything you know you think of could be considered related to health. So, what, you know, what priorities? Where, where do we want to put our energies, and and that, what would that look like? So, so we'll we'll do that. Um, Can I make have a light agenda? One mm -hmm. more comment. I I'm thinking now about this whole thing. You know, we just went through this whole talk about this particular tobacco policy and it would seem to me that with all policies where we would want to be making sure that they um that they're that that we're thinking about equity and inclusion and I, I, when i think about this one particular policy i can't think of any way that we've really considered that or so i mean is that something that we need to be doing with maybe all the policies that the board of health oversees should we be looking at it through the framework of equity diversity and inclusion and what does that mean for actual policy because mm -hmm. that's where real change happens right is with policy well that's a great point because that is what we wrote in 2020 that um where we um, wrote that statement and what we were going to do about it was that we were going to make sure that in all our, of our policies that that was considered. Right. That was a good point. So, I mean, maybe we should start with this one and I don't know if, you know, Cheryl can be helpful there, Meredith, or if there's, or if you, your expertise or somebody else on staff who can maybe, you know, help help us think about that or maybe it's other communities that have already considered it and what do their tobacco regs look like the, the tobacco regs are pretty cookie cutter but i think it's perhaps about getting the people that it's going to affect to the table and getting a diverse group there because we don't know the impacts you know um so I think that's one thing that we could work on. We could do better. Um, but yeah, Cheryl is probably has some of these answers and can help us navigate through that. So can we put that on the list of questions for her, please? And Meredith, can I confirm that as I understand it through the limited circles that I'm in, this is getting some funding. Um, 
uh, in the state. Is that true? Are you seeing that or, or yeah. each grant needs to have a component of this? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, they need to weave it into, into the work, the fabric of the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The state is, um, they're gonna hire subject matter experts. I don't know what they're, if they're gonna call them diversity, inclusion, equity officers, but subject matter, matter experts, and they're gonna start training boards of health and they're gonna start training health department staff. So they're working on that. I think it'll probably be the end of the first quarter of uh, the, the new calendar year before that's rolled out, but yeah. They, um, I'm looking to take on a new grant and one of my asks was for 0.25 for a DEI um, and they weren't ready to say yes because they're, again, this is really, they want to roll this out. So they don't yeah. want the burden on the local to do so. I, just, uh, just a recommendation we can talk about it when we carve out some time, to, um, but uh, to Janet's point, um, you know, we could do something like a citizens advisory group that represents um, BIPOC folks and folks of DEI um, that that advises um, the board uh, on every policy that we we make, and we run it through this citizens advisory group, or or this this is a group that could be within DHHS too, because we've tried. You know, we try really hard to get more diversity on our board. Um, and sometimes that's really difficult, but if we had a, a, a lower stake group, lower in the sense of they don't have to come to a meeting every month or, but we had a group of people that, you know, would be willing to do this kind of work, that might be helpful. Because us, us looking at our policies through our lenses may not point out <laughs> where the inequities are. Um, so just a recommendation. Excellent points. Thank you. Um, anything else on this subject? Great. Uh, Meredith, did you have some updates you wanted to share? Um, sure. Let's see. Um, so I know I've mentioned in the past um, about our public health excellence grant, but let me just, just so everyone's informed and on the same page, give you a little background. Um, so in essence, you know, the COVID pandemic has shown that there is a true decentralization of our public health system in Massachusetts. There's 351 communities, 351 boards of health that aren't adequately structured, staffed, or financed to meet large scale public health, public health, um, pandemics, right? COVID-19, obviously all of our communities, um, didn't have the resources to meet the demands of the pandemic. So due to this, in response to this, the local commission, uh, special commission on local and regional health created an action plan to accelerate movements and LHD and local health departments so that we're pre better prepared to meet future challenges. In April of 2020, Governor Baker signed um, an act relative to 2020 to strengthening local and regional health systems and um, also known as the state, state Action for Public Health Excellence or the SAFE Act. One of the components of this act is a funding stream, which they're calling the Public Health Excellence Grant for local health departments, which enables cities and towns to plan for and expand sharing of staff and resources to improve local health effectiveness and efficiency. Um, back in 2020, the city of Northampton submitted a proposal for a public health excellent grant where public health excellent grant where we could provide um, uh, Hampshire County with um, public health shared public health nursing services in a very timely appropriate appropriate um, fashion. So we were awarded this grant. I think 17 of the Hampshire County public uh, Hampshire County local health department signed on to this grant. And in response to um, signing on with the money, we hired public health nurses who would assist with infectious disease management and surveillance, coordinate a rapid response fr uh, framework of shared public health nursing, 
um, provide data analysis reports, maps of communicable disease, both on a local and a county level, using our information from our health information exchange database, which is proprietary to the Northampton Health Department, and then create like culturally sensitive town specific um, prevention and education materials. So that's kind of like the foundation of what the proposal was written. Well, long story short, the reason I give you that background is the work is great. It's a nine year grant. Um, wow. what, what the state, where the state is at, right? In order for them to really understand and address the needs in public health, they, they're doing a capacity assessment. Um, with this information collected by DPH, they'll be able to align training resources, with regional needs, expand workforce development efforts, improve access to public health services all across the Commonwealth. And this capacity assessment is three different phases. The first phase was a baseline capacity assessment where we had to um, just give a list of names and email addresses of everyone that worked within your department or board of health. The second was a workforce um, survey and a workforce capacity assessment, and it's a survey on education, training, and experiences. And then the third part, the third phase of this assessment is a document request. The reason I bring this up is because I'm asking all of you today, if you received an email from a Michelle Cernick or anyone from DPH asking to fill out the phase two capacity assessment in the last month. Suzanne, you're muted. Yeah, I don't, I don't recall getting that. You don't recall me getting, okay. So there are a lot- I didn't either, but it would be helpful to know exactly who would it, who it would have come from. So it would have come from a Michelle K. Cernick at mass.gov. Michelle.k.surdyk at mass.gov. No, check my spam folder. <laughs> yeah. So there are lots of boards of health that didn't get the survey and I don't know um, what the problem is, but they're hoping to open it back up for a very short period of time um, so I'm going to submit all of your names to Michelle to let them know that you didn't receive this survey. And if they open it back up, you might have like a 48 hour window to, to do this workforce survey. There is going to be a lot of questions on there that you're not going to know the answers to. So just answer it to the best of your ability. I, um, I want to say there was I don't know, 36 pages of questions. It should take you about 30 to 45 minutes to complete the survey. And in the same breath, there is going to be a lot of aha, mo aha mo moments like, oh my gosh, we do this. We're supposed to do this by mass general law. Even being in public health for um, 18 years now, there are things that I saw in the survey that I never realized were um, a mandate by M mass general law that we were supposed to do. So it was kind of interesting going through it anyways. But so with that being said, um, we, Northampton, have, have completed all three of our um, capacity assessment phases. But if you, the board, did not do this, I would really like and hope that they can open it back up. And so you have an opportunity to do so. Hey, Mayor, I just put the link in the chat box. It's probably closed. No, because yeah. it just came Pardon. out three days ago. It says it's closed. Oh, closed. Me. closed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for trying, though, Kelly. So, um, with anyways, so that's the PHE grant. So my hope is again, my proposal was to provide public health nursing to Hampshire County. Moving forward, we 
I hope the capacity assessment identifies with our 17 communities that many of our communities are not meeting the benchmarks of inspectional services. Therefore, we will get funded to hire more inspectors to go out to our communities that are part of our grant. I mean, I know Hadley doesn't do, you know, their their inspections of their food service establishments twice a year like they're supposed to, not to any fault of their own. It's just public health has been underfunded forever. Yeah, I mean, we, we used to call, it was amazing because I worked in public health my whole life and it was, yeah, DPH has a lot of unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they weren't funded, but they yeah. were mandated. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So if you see it, um, please fill it out. It'd be super helpful. I I sat through the um, to the MH MAHB. I think you must have sent it to me. One of you sent it to me, Joanna Meredith, um, about the regulations that um, Cheryl Sabara and others did the training on. Yep. And I think they talked about they talked about these surveys then. That was a while ago. Yeah, the survey probably went out in September, mid September. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. So I don't know how it got missed, um, but everyone who had, you know, who's part of our department had to fill it out. Kelly on an admin level, our inspectors, our prevention specialists. And again, a lot of the information they didn't necessarily know or could answer, but yeah, it was a requirement. How does the state know all the boards of health members? I had to provide them with your uh, your name and email addresses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I, and it's I anonymous, so they can't tell you who filled it out or not. Okay. Yeah. I, I I searched through all my mailboxes. I didn't get anything. You didn't get anything? Okay. All right. So, well, thank you. Um, the second department update. You might have seen the press release that came out. Last week, um, we were awarded the EAPS grant, and uh, it's $450,000, which we are super thankful for. The city applied for it, I believe, last uh, October or November, and um, because their proposal didn't include public safety, they weren't given the award. So um, Senator Coverford and our mayor really have been advocating you know, with our new restructure and us being a public safety model um, within, you know, collaborative um, to to give us this award. And they we didn't have to reapply. They just funded the original proposal with um, the amendments to the way that we're structured now, which is fantastic. Um, are you, before I move on. Did you just say what that grant is for? Oh, for the EAPS grant? Yeah, certainly. So just so everybody is all on the same page, because we have new members here, um, in May of this last year, the mayor, by administrative order, restructured the health department to the Department of Health and Human Services. And under that, they put the Department of Community Cares, which is to provide um, community safety services, which I like to call additional resources to public safety in situations that don't involve violence or serious crime. Um, so, you know, we carry out or we are going to carry out this mission by hiring community responders with relevant lived experience who are culturally compassionate, enthusiastic, and well-trained to serve all the versatile needs of our community. So with that, um, with with that department being under the DHHS, we were given a small budget to um, stand up a department, which we are in the planning phases of doing so. And we have um, you know, goals and benchmarks that we wanna meet and we're writing a strategic plan, but um, we there wasn't enough money to, to um, execute how we wanted to, or how the city initially wanted to roll out this department. So this funding um, will help us do many things. A, we can increase the amount of community responders that we intend intended on hiring. Um, 
I'm sorry, and the EAPS is Equitable Approaches to Public Safety. That's what EAPS mean. Um, we need like innovative technology for improved community engagement, which this funding is going to allow for um, ensuring privacy, language translation, accessibility services. Um, we need a vehicle that would also meet ADA requirements to ensure equity and transportation of high risk health complexity cases, such as people with wheelchair or disability needs. Um, we're gonna hire some contra uh, some consultants to help write strategic plans to help facilitate um, a advisory board. Um, we are going to need some legal aid and advocacy around complex cases in involving public safety. Um, so we're, we're just starting to identify how we're going to use the funding above and beyond what we were budgeted for this fiscal year. Um, I haven't seen the contract yet because, um, again, this was just awarded and they, the state hasn't provided it to me. So it'll be interesting what the, the parameters around spending are. I'm just kind of thinking ahead, of, you know, ahead, like how at, having held this for about four months now, what are the needs that we do have that I have identified that we don't have funding for? So that's what I'm thinking of right now, but there might be restrictions. We need space. Um, I know, uh, you know, leasing some space for our community responders to actually have a place to bring back someone who might need just some time and space to cool down and have a cup of coffee, or maybe, I don't know what that looks like, but these again are some things that we've identified early on. So we're happy to have the funding. And it's our hope, I know in the original RFP, because again, I wasn't involved in writing the proposal, but in the original RFP, it was up to five years for funding. So that would be 450,000 for the next five years, hopefully. Sounds great. <laughs> What's that? I said congratulations. Well, thank you. I didn't yeah. do work though. <laughs> it was nice having something written and just handed to me. Mm -hmm. But it, it's just going to help that department in so many different ways. So that's, that's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Let me just pull up a document for a second. <laughs> Here it is. Just seeing if there's any other updates I can give to you. Um, oh, I'm sure you all saw the press release that we're no longer doing our regular scheduled clinics at the Elks Club. Our last clinic was the 28th of October but we are still doing pop-up mobile clinics for the bivalent booster. Um, we're doing flu clinics. Um, Elliot is really kind of honing in on the populations that are missed um, and really advocating on our teams going out to them. I mean, we've been doing a good job of that, but holding both at the same time was really difficult and taxing on our resources. So now that we're not holding a regular scheduled clinic two, three, four times a week, it gives us more opportunity to meet people where they're at. Um, oh, here's a good one. It's under inspectional services. Um, we are actually piloting a software program this November and December called WimWam to do all of our inspections online and then they'll be automatically uploaded to the web to our web page so all food service inspection reports will now be accessible on the DHHS website so that's pretty cool Meredith how much detail will there be will it just be a pass fail or or every checkpoint is going to be on there so it won't be every checkpoint because that would entail it being like a 36 page report it's very comprehensive um, what it will do is there's a short form narrative that will just list the violations that were identified at that time during the inspection. 
So that might be a one or two page report. Do the restaurants know that's happening? Yep, yep. We informed them that that was, actually we informed them a year ago um, that this was coming. And then we, on our permit application cover letter that just went out a couple weeks ago, let our establishments know that, um, you know, we will be piloting it November, December, and then we will be going online come January. At one time, we discussed posting a score on the front door of all the restaurants, as they do in some major cities. Um, and that did not move forward. It couldn't the way we were doing inspections right. because a lot of things were very subjective. Right. But with this online inspect uh, inspection report software, I think, you know, after maybe a year of using it, there's, you, it can't be subjective. It's either yes or no. Do you, you know, are you in violation or are you in, in compliance? That there could be a scoring mechanism produced, but I want to give it some time sure. um, to make sure that we work all the kinks out. But yeah, I think our restaurants knowing that the inspection reports are going to be online and accessible at the press of a button, um, I, it might just make them want them to do better. <laughs> I don't know. How often are they inspected? So twice a year, our high risk establishments, those that serve a lot of um, um, time and temperature control for safety food products and or high risk populations, we try to do three times a year. We wanna to get to risk-based inspections, meaning our high risk, we do three and our very low risk, we do one to average it out. Um, but by mandate, it is twice a year. And if they have uh, violations, they go back sooner, yes. Yes, we go back for re-inspections. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean by high risk populations? So if they serve the elderly, um, so maybe it's a, um, a long-term care facility or, you know, people with, who are compromised, health compromised. Um, yeah. Anything else? Um, that's about it. Oh, we're having our, since COVID, our first in-person um, DART training, which is amazing. Um, it's going to be December 14th at the log cabin. We have about 220 police officers signed up for this training, which is just huge. Um, and my team is super excited about that. If any of you would like to attend for some, all of the training so you can get informed on what the DART program is, just let me know. And we also have a DART campaign that just, I think, actually officially was launched this morning. Today may be the first date for the um, Bay State Noble catchment area, so out in Hamden County, because DART is relatively new out in that area. And I think that's it for updates. What is DART? So DART is um, a program that we have. It's um, a, oh, it's a comprehensive opioid op opioid <laughs> op um, opioid response team that goes out. So whenever there is um, an overdose, we at some point a team gets together to provide harm reduction services or any type of health or help or information that the person is willing to take. Um, and we have police officers trained in harm reduction strategies. So we provide all of our DART officers with Narcan. Um, they carry it, how to use it, fentanyl strips. So it's all about harm reduction and meeting people where they're at, um, connecting people with recovery coaches if they'd like. Um, and it's all police officers. Yes, that's the model we started with. We are shifting a little bit. Some communities want to shift from police to EMS services to be doing the work. But okay. So in addition to that, we have a lot of staff 
vacancies. We have um, two public health nursing vacancies right now. We have a DART coordinator right now. We're looking to um, have a DCC coordinator, um, community responders, and then we're also looking for some subject matter experts in inspectional services um, to help facilitate the uh, excellence work. So we have a slew of openings. So if you can help circulate job descriptions, that would be fantastic. Great. Um, and I can't remember where we were last time we met, but the ventilation task force uh, did submit a proposal for ARPA money. And uh, originally they said we'd hear at the end of December and now they've moved that to early January. But uh, Amy Kaylin has been great and you know, submitted through her because she's got other grants going and we shall see. Good luck with that, Joanne. That's really important. I know y'all did a lot of work on that. So good luck. Yeah. So now we're trying to just sort of finalize, you know, the forms that a restaurant would submit and how what our process would look like in reviewing um, those applications and all that. So we're working on that. We're a good good group. Mm -hmm. Anything else? The only thing else on our um, on our agenda was our just looking at our old mask advisory, which said that um, transmission was high and we recommend that people wear masks in indoor public spaces. And I was just on the cusp of thinking that maybe we might be able to change that sort of, you know, but now the curve is looking like this <laughs> going back up. So I'm not advocating for a change in that. Um, anybody have any other thoughts about that? I, I'm just curious, did, uh, there was some, did the school system make a change, uh, Meredith, on masks? On universal masking? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if they made a policy change, but what they did was they disbanded the ad hoc committee. Um, with, right, yeah, which okay. was the committee that was, they wanted to make COVID policy. Okay, yeah. Oh, so the, whole, the, the school board itself is taking it on? No, it's going back to the SHAC committee, which okay. is superintendent. Oh, really? <laughs> been a ping pong ball, yeah. Because they couldn't decide, they were divided group, right? Well, yeah, this is the fourth time it's been tossed back in our court, you know, let the um, committee of public health experts and the superintendent make the decisions on COVID related policies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Any other business anyone wants to bring up? I think we're good. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? A motion. Um, just a point of order. Do we talk about the next meeting outside of the the meeting or within the meeting? Yeah, I was just thinking about that. We should just make mention when our next meeting is scheduled for fifteenth. The fifteenth. Does that work for everyone? Are we back on track on a what third Thursday. Thursday? Okay, good. Thank you. Is there is there any chance we could do any other day that week? Anybody? I have Cheryl scheduled for the 15th. So if we do change it, I want to make sure she's available. Do you want to propose a uh, a different day, Dallas? And I, then we can. I mean, any, any, any other day. It's just the one day. Uh, just the only other day I can do that week, unfortunately, is when, Wednesday. I could also do any other day the previous week too. That's just the one. I'm away the previous week. How's the 14th for everyone? And then we'll check with Cheryl. It's okay with Janet, Suzanne? That works for me. Wednesday works also. That's what we were talking about, Wednesday. Right, that works for me. Okay, so Wednesday or Thursday works for everyone here. 
Um, Meredith, if you check with Cheryl, if she can do the Wednesday, we'll switch to Wednesday. Yep. Mm -hmm. Would you let us know sooner rather than later, as soon as you find out? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Dallas, did you make a motion? I did, yes. <laughs> what was your motion? Oh, it was to adjourn, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Dallas? Suzanne? Yes. Janet? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Good to see you all. Thank you.